Welcome to the sixth and final session of the Gift of Poets, a sampler sponsored by the Broome County Arts Council's Artisan Gallery in partnership with Word Place at the Bundy Museum. This project will highlight several poets in the coming weeks in honor of April's National Poetry Month. My name is Connie Barnes, manager of Artisan Gallery at the Broome County Arts Council. And with me is Jay Barrett Wolf, founder of Word Place at the Bundy Museum. Brian Pregas from the Bundy Museum is also with us behind the scenes to record the sessions and produce the recordings. Our first poet tonight is Craig Jory. Craig is from the Wilkes-Barre area of Pennsylvania and the author of over 20 books of poetry, including postcards and ancient texts, a 40 year collection of napkin poems, 15 stones, prose poems from Italy, Chile, Lithuania, and the spaces in between, and Thumb Notes Almanac, Hitchhiking the Marcellus Shale, docu-poems from his observation and interviews while hitchhiking rural roads in the heart of Northeastern PA's fracking region. A 2021 Fulbright Scholar to Chile, Craig was awarded Laureate of the 2011, and excuse me if I mispronounce this, Detet A Name It, International Albanian Poetry Festival. And the following year, he received this prestigious F. Lamott Bellin Scholarship for Artists. Craig toured the Balkans in 2018, giving poetry readings in Albania, Macedonia, and Kosovo through PEN Albania, of which he was awarded honorary membership. In 2019, Craig was honored with the Alexander the Great Gold Medal for Letters and Arts through UNESCO Piraeus, on Salamina Island in Greece, and the Daphne Lifetime Achievement Award in Aula, Italy. He is currently under lockdown in Scranton. Welcome, Craig. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> it's so important to hear an introduction like that, um, not having left the house in over a year. So I want to thank you for the invitation and uh, thank everybody out there. I want to read some um, some of the postcards from my new book, Postcards in Ancient Texts, which gives me, and I hope gives you all a, a greater sense that the world is out there and we will soon be back inside it. Sometimes it's not leaving, it's just going away. But from which grace shall I go next? Closing, as in gathering all my desires, having grown larger from each of you, all my watchfulness, from which gesture shall my way be guarded or guided, pulling my coat tight, whose voice to keep the line taut, simply walking off? Postmark Mexico, La Pinita de Heltemba, 1991. I've never forgotten the woman standing naked on the rocks at the bend of the Blackfoot River under the full sun playing a violin. Tonight, I climbed out on the rocks above the sea and made myself naked under the full moon. You who have ever heard those sad, and never at peace at being sad sounds that come to me with their own lunar and tidal pool through my small donut flute will hear in your sleep my song to you of the sea, barking dogs and roosters, all the sad and never at peace at being sad flapping of wings and fins in so much light that won't ever go back to sleep forever. You will feel in your sleep between your legs what I feel between my legs when I sit down on this rock, this stony back of an iguana. Postmark Oregon, Newport, 1981. This is the picture postcard from sepia 
the ocean belly up between its sandy sheets, and that beautiful sky last year with gulls so south now, only a massive rusty hole. This is the vintage salt fog laced with squid. The cliff house shadows a slow burnt canvas fire. No one wishes you were here. This is, a, this is as far as you can see, the last steamer smoking the horizon, a torrential anguish biting a torrential blood wind. This is our old brown ghost looking back through the film. Postmark Argentina, Buenos Aires, 1994. At the end of the table, an explosion of lovemaking breaks out. Borges pounds his fist. Gardel tosses water in his face. Martin Fierro flashes a blade and slices his tie. This is a regular Monday night, reading the fortune from the psalms of our hands, gypsy scarves leaping from our mouths. Your little sister strikes up the harmonica, a tune heard so long ago the tablecloth catches fire. Pablo's humongous breasts bleed against our wrists for us to drink. Geronimo, the waiter is now 15 Janus faces on the backs of our chairs. Your mother walks in past her bedtime, selling rose stems. The women bite into snakes. Ah, the women with their intoxicated feet on the switch. A meaty strand of black hair writhes across the napkins. This music inside a plate of bones. You could reach through the tiles and lift out this night painted inside a burlap sack. In half an hour, the nurse will bring you your bottle of wine. Let me kiss you now with that look on your face. Postmark Canada, Montreal, 1990. Little girls, if you don't notice the needle marks or the impatient rocking of the leg, if you don't notice their mouths form words they're not speaking when a man walks in, boy, do they like to play dress up, smoking and giggling with ways to get even, chewing that gummy taste from their mouths with gum and ice from Cokes. These women are like your little girls up all night at a slumber party. If you don't look under their coats, their eyes are made up to be eyes. Postmark Macedonia, 2004. Along the river, an intense fog incinerates the air, sky and earth on fire in an impenetrable gray appetite, swallowing stone and street. I gather my bearings from the echoes of voices clanging off each other from all directions. I step weightless and spinning, something brushes my leg, my feet the sky, my, hand, my head the earth, something brushes my shoulder, a silhouette of a bicycle ridden by, I'm afraid to say, for fear of saying I'm one of them. Postmark Italy, Soncino, 2019. The fish are doing their egg and sperm thing in the canal and the air smells like lunch, slathered with rosemary garlic oil and mowed grass. There was a time when the distance between bait and sushi was disturbing, but I've gotten better, like poetry, throwing my line in where it doesn't belong and easy does it, I take a nap. The rabbits guarding the castle know, know this, Hop, hopping down to the canal for a drink, the dead one in particular, who's just been lying there. Only time knows what goes on inside any of us. The fog's thick for about a week, and I'm hungry for what we can't see, like poetry, 
we'll eat anything we can get our hands on. And I'd like to finish with, um, with an Easter poem, Postmark Italy, Sancino 2018. Google Earth Soncino, find the water tower, find me underneath or on liquid nights on top of blowing pigeon sounds through my thumbs and Google Earth pigeons, find my thumbs with my hands cupped perched on the top rung, on feathery nights find me nesting in the burnt out street lamp, Google Earth burnt out street lamps and find me laying all my eggs in one basket. Find me shitting where I eat in the hope of resurrection and Google Earth resurrection. Find me pulling the pin on all my colorful eggs with my teeth and lobbing them into the sunset filled with chocolate bunnies and Google Earth chocolate bunnies. Find me tangled in Easter grass under the rubble of, ah, here's a good title, resurrection and the Easter grass of Damascus. Google Earth, Damascus, find the water tower. Thank you so much. Thank you, Craig. That was amazing. And just touring the world with your mm -hmm. poetry. Mm -hmm. The question that comes to mind first for me is there are poets of place who never leave where they live. Uh, oh, Wendell Berry is a good example of that. Yes, who, that writes, who writes in ridiculous depth about this place that he occupies. Right. And uh, William Least Heat Moon wrote about the Midwest. His book about Kansas is stunning. Mm. You move. And when you move, you you apply that kind of vision all around the world. How how do you find that? How do you see well, the difference between the poets that stay in one place and go deep and you're managing to go fairly deep all around the world? Well, I you know, I have great admiration for anybody who can stay in one place at all. Um, I was adopted from birth. So um, as, if, as Edmund Jabe says, it, it, Earth, birth is our first exile. And if that's true, um, um, being, being given up, it was my second exile. So I, I was my most often asked question as, as a kid and, and in schools were, um, you know, what's this got to do with me? That was, you know, that was the easiest question to, to to, to blow off and then get interested in the ceiling, the water stains in the ceiling tiles. But uh, in my older, later years, I've spent 15 years hitchhiking North America. Um, whenever all my friends, all my friends now were in you know, college and graduate school. And so I, I was always moving from place to place. But um, when I started writing from the place, my most often uh, asked question was, where am I and who are these people? <laughs> and, and in my attempt to answer that question, um, these, these napkin poems, and these are napkin, these are poems that, that, were, didn't, that were misfits. They, they just didn't fit into my other books. But as, as you can see the form as postcards, they, they really come together and, um, and take up that... that um, it's interesting. You shake, you sort of shake the colander, and the ones that don't go into the books wind up creating their own little universe. Exactly, and I, I tell everybody that I work with that uh, you know don't dis, you know don't don't throw away your notebooks that are filled with discarded poems and discarded thoughts and half baked whatever. Don't throw don't throw that away. Indeed, thank you very much, Craig. That was a beautiful set of poems. Thank books. you, Barrett, and thank you so much. Thank you so much, Craig. Um, our next poet this evening is Neil Silverblatt. Mm -hmm. Neil is the founder, director of Voices of Poetry. Since 2012, 
He has curated and presented more than 400 poetry events in various venues in Massachusetts, Connecticut, New York, and New Jersey, including Provincetown Art Association and Museum, the Rubin Museum of Art, McNally Jackson Books, and Jefferson Market Library in New York City, the Mount Edith Wharton's home in, in Lenox, Mass., and, and Chesterwood in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. Those events have featured acclaimed poets, including former U.S. Poet Laureate Robert Pinsky and Pulitzer Prize winner Frank Bidart, Bidart. as well as those who have not yet published a word. Neil is also the host administrator of the Voice of Poetry group page on Facebook, which at last count had more than 9,300 members around the globe, including several poets laureate of the U.S., various states and cities and towns, and lovers of the written, spoken, and occasionally sung word. Neil's poems have appeared in numerous print and online literary journals and anthologies, including Plume Poetry Journal, Mom Egg Review, Lily Poetry Review, Tiferet Re Journal, American Journal of Poetry, and Tikkun Daily. His poem, Burnt Offering, was selected by Massachusetts Poetry as their poem of the moment. His work has also been selected for various anthologies, including Collateral Damage and Culinary Poems. He is the author of several poetry collections, So Far, So Good, and Present Tense. His most recent poetry collection, Past Imperfect, was nominated for the Mass Book Award in Poetry. He has been nominated several times for a Pushcart Prize and in his spare time, Battles Stage 4 Metastatic Colon Cancer. Welcome, Neil. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, and I should start off by thanking Constance and my good friend Barrett for inviting me to do this. Uh, this is a, a lovely honor and uh, Craig, great work. Thank you for sharing it. Delightful to hear your, uh, your postcard poems. Beautiful stuff. Thank you. So I thought I would just give you, uh, give you like a completely unscientific survey of my poetry um, and uh, starting off with some poems from my hopefully soon to be new collection titled Burnt Offerings, um, most of which have appeared in various journals. Um, this poem is, summarizes my fondness for both religious imagery and boxing. And uh, you'll hear why in a moment, I hope. Um, no Mas. One wonders if between the second and third nails, he was tempted even briefly to cry out, no mas, to throw up or down his bloodied hands, to surrender the crown as Roberto did in the eighth round of that fight with Sugar Ray. But unlike Duran, he just took the jabs long after the ref should have called it, not delivering a right hook or even the promise of a rematch three days later. As I approach my 15th round, my personal redeemer is Muhammad, peace be upon him, who had his crown stolen but got it back, blow by blow, who, if he could not walk on water, could still float like a butterfly, and with jaw in need of wiring and ribs splintered, taunt foreman and fate. Is that all you got, George? Is that all you got? Um, a poem which summarizes my attitude toward life, which uh, appropriately titled Vita Brevis. It is addictive, this habit of living. Just when you've had your fill, you're jonesing for another hit. Um, this is a poem um, based on a wonderful Japanese art form called Kintsu Koroi, uh, which is the Japanese art of repairing broken pottery with lacquer dusted or mixed with powdered gold, silver, or platinum. It, it treats breakage and repair as part of the history of the object rather than as something to disguise. Kintsu Koroi. 
First, it must be broken. I would recommend dropped from a modest height or humbled by circumstance. Second, the shards which must be gathered jagged piece by jagged piece must not be easily reassembled by all the king's horses or all the king's men. Third, the precious metals must, like us, be ground into dust, particulates no longer recognizable as precious, until they can be reduced to molten metal and poured out, like us. Then, and only then, can you start. This is um, a poem about one of my favorite and most troubling biblical passages. It begins with an epigram, epigraph. After these events, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, Abraham answered, I am here. God said, take your son, your only son whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah. Offer him up as an entirely burnt offering there on one of the mountains that I will show you. Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 through 2. Burnt offering. When the order was given, no questions were asked. Not what kind of binding should be used, cloth or leather straps. Not how his hands should be bound, reef knot or blood knot. Not whether the boy should be told or given a chance to flee before the butchering began. Not whether the boy would feel pain. Not even why. Like Stanley Milgram's experiment in which the test subjects obediently complied, administering incrementally higher shocks despite the screams, Abraham went along, just following orders. There is no mention of how loudly Isaac screamed or begged for his life. There is no mention of whether after that afternoon, he again went with his father for a walk in the woods or could look him in the eye or what they discussed that night over dinner. Um, since my mom's um, yurt site, the anniversary of her passing just recently passed, and uh, in honor of my dear friend, Elizabeth Estella, uh, who is uh, battling all sorts of illnesses, she said, and this is her favorite poem, so I'm reading this in her honor. Uh, I hope that when this is aired, she will be watching. Uh, just a word of brief word of explanation. Um, my mom kept kosher, which means that she could not eat milk and meat together. Butternut squash atonement, a recipe. In the beginning was the word, and the word was butter, unsalted cream butter, not Fleischmann's or Imperial, not I can't believe, although I don't any longer, just enough to hide the wrapper from my mom, who would ask, who in her 95 years never ate milk with meat, knowingly. Into this sinful butter is cast chopped celery and onions, and whole garlic cloves, two or three, cooked until the celery is soft, the onion translucent, and the mixture smells of home. Now chicken stock is added, four cups, kosher for my mom, who would ask, who in her 95 years never ate non-kosher meat, lest her entry be barred into paradise. Into this comes butternut or winter squash, roasted until smooth and mashed until resembling the color of the clay of her Kishinev shtetl. Then savory and rosemary, burlesque strippers who tease the flavor out of this soup. At the very end, cream is added, non-dairy for my mom, who would ask, and fresh grated nutmeg. Once, by mistake, I used real cream and lied to her. How she loved the taste of that soup. How she forgave the lie asking for seconds. Oh, do not cast her from paradise on account of that tainted soup. Let the sin be on me and the sweet taste be on her lips for eternity. Um, sometimes, 
uh, we get inspiration for poems from very unlikely sources. Um, this poem came about after visiting a dear friend in the hospital who was on some major painkillers. And um, she asked me if I was in love and uh, uh, seeing anybody. And then she drifted off to sleep. And then when she came to, she said, oh, being in love is like being in Chicago. And then she drifted off. She wasn't trying to be witty. She was just whacked out on painkillers. Um, of course, I wrote down the phrase. And uh, this was the result. Chicago. Being in love, she says, her voice heavy with the lauded, is like being in Chicago. And I smile, having been in Chicago, and felt the winds whip off Lake Michigan down Well Street, cutting to the bone, no matter how many layers, taking your breath away, knocking you off your feet, bringing you to tears, leaving you craving another's warmth, and delauded or no, her directions are spot on. This is a poem which um, I must thank Barrett for helping me edit. And uh, as always, his advice is also spot on. Um, this concerns uh, the great George Reeves, who as some of us of a certain age will recall, um, acted as the Avengers of Superman. Um, and uh, in his honor, Elegy for Man of Steel. As a child, I watched George Reeves darting into and out of phone booths to change his clothes, tearing off his fedora and horn-rimmed glasses, stripping off his suit, white button-down shirt and tie, revealing cape and tights, which like him were always at the ready. I watched him racing and flying across our small black and white TV set to fight untruth, injustice, and the un-American way, and wondered where he stood on the beatings of white freedom riders or the hosings of black protesters who also raced in torn and blood-soaked suits and ties across our TV set. The summer of my sixth year, when the twisted black and white bodies of Schwerner, Cheney, and Goodman were found in Philadelphia, Mississippi, I questioned what side Clark or his alter ego were on and whether he had arrived there too late, even with all that racing and flying. Surely he was on their side, he an outside agitator and a New York City journalist. Then, after all those phone booths, all that racing and flying, George got himself shot and killed in his mid forties, like our other heroes. So of course he was one of us. I knew it all along and loved him all the more. Thank you, Neil. Oh, my Thank pleasure. <laughs> um, that did come out quite well. I was, I was really happy to hear the final iteration of that poem um, or, anyway. or the iteration to date since <laughs> Many, for many of us, there is no such thing as oh, like, finishing like, a poem. Yeah, like Paul uh, Valeri said famously, a poem is never repeated, it's really abandoned. Yes. Yes. I have been living in that for yes. many, many years. Yes. Um, for you, I ask, the circle around you, as you said, you've been battling cancer for years. Elizabeth, of course, is a friend of ours. Yes. Who is also a poet and is also battling cancer. Um, I am a cancer survivor. How does that color your view of writing and what you write about? Great question. Um, great question. And somebody actually said to me, oh, you know, the fact that you had cancer must be you know, great material for writing. And I said, you know what? Really, between having great material for writing and not having cancer, I'd rather have, I'd rather not write. <laughs> I'd rather take a plumbing. Um, you know, I, I I would easily forfeit writing if if I was assured of not having cancer anymore. Um, but it, it it's a it's an interesting question. What I wrestled with, on the one hand, I feel like 
and I mean this quite literally, like there's a hand in, in the small of my back uh, pushing me, like, you know, I, like maybe don't keep on going. Um, you don't have time to, you know, to sit and fart around. Um, you gotta, you better be writing, you better be organizing, you better be doing, uh, in Beckett, Samuel Beckett's words, you know, can't go on, must go on, shall go on. Um, so there's that attitude, which is, uh, born of generations of willful Jews. Um, but beyond that, it's given me a sense of, to use Dr. King's phrase, the fierce urgency of now. Um, so that a lot of times, you know, I don't, I used to, list, you know, agonize over this poem or that poem, uh, editing it you know, to a fairly well until it, until it resembled, you know, a chi- you know, a children's idea of cut out lace. Um, yes. It, so the writing, the process itself has changed. Um, yeah, and it's given me some, you know, it's given me some great material. As I said, I would easily surrender that great material if I could have my health back. Um, but it, it is, um, I would not recommend it. <laughs> if you ha- if you know, if you, if you are visited by an angel who says, you know, I'll give you a Pulitzer, but you have to have cancer first. Skip the Pulitzer. Really, it's not worth it. Um, not that I'm in line to get a Pulitzer, but still. You I would idea. tend to agree with you. Yeah. That, that. Now, a Nobel is a different story. <laughs> yes. Yeah. You know, if I can be assured of a Nobel, then, you know, maybe. <laughs> but, uh, or publishes Clearinghouse. <laughs> Thank you very much, Neil. My pleasure. Thank you, Barrett. Great to see you. And, hope to, and I hope to see you in person once this plague leaves us. Indeed. Thank you, Neil. My Thank pleasure. You. Thank wonderful. you so much for having me. You bet. Our final poet tonight is Richard Bernstein. Richard was born in New York City and raised in northern New Jersey. Richard spent the bulk of his childhood in an apple and peach orchard overlooking the Manhattan skyline. After receiving a BA in English from Muhlenberg College in Allentown, PA in 1980, where he worked with Gerald Stern, Len Roberts, and other Lehigh Valley poets, He spent six years odd jobbing his way around the United States. Eventually, he made his way to central New York and completed his MA in English at Binghamton University, where he was fortunate enough to be a student in Ruth Stone's poetry workshop. An 11-time recipient of the Bright Hill Press New York State High School Poetry Teacher of the Year Award, as well as the recipient of many other awards, grants, and distinctions for teaching and writing, Bernstein is currently in his 35th year as a high school English teacher in Norwich, New York. He's also employed as an adjunct instructor of English at SUNY Morrisville State College. His most recent chapbook, To the Occupant of Apartment 6X, was released by Finishing Line Press in 2015. Six poems in the book had previously appeared in the Georgia Review. Stephen Corey, the longtime editor of the Georgia Review, writes, Bernstein is a rare, romantic cynic with an expansive metaphorical imagination, one that sweeps you up and pulls you into his quietly extravagant takes on life. Bernstein's poems have also appeared in San Diego Poetry Press, Arcade, Workplace, A Journal for Academic Labor, Alternatives to Surrender, an anthology of poems dealing with cancer, loss and recovery, and many other journals and anthologies. He has read and performed his work at universities, poetry festivals, libraries, galleries, bars, and many other venues, including in competition at the National Poetry Slam. Welcome, Richard. Thank you, Connie. Thank you, Barrett and Neil and Craig. Thank you for the invitation. I've chosen three poems that I think might resonate with the moment. All were written before the pandemic. So if and when they rise to the moment, as I hope they will, even one as anomalous as this one, I want to say, isn't that what they were trained to do? 
all three explore the potentially creative space that for me is often the intersection of anonymity and intimacy. During the pandemic, which is obviously still with us, we often experienced and referred to it as seclusion or isolation on smart days as the coupling of memory and desire, which all writers know. And it was all those things. It was before the pandemic and it will be afterwards. The first poem is called Wheel Man, W-H-E-E-L, Wheel Man. It begins with an epigraph from Sid Caesar. The guy who invented the first wheel was an idiot. The guy who invented the other three, he was a genius. Wheel Man. October's cold assurances had surprised us to the bone its choir of print dresses and talcum powder, already halfway to Lake Okeechobee or Scottsdale, and Mrs. Grandview still in her garden across the street with her husband's hands and head, his penis and heart, the smell of smoke still on them as she worked the soil, the urn beside her nearly empty, as if there were something left unsaid. Looking back, it was all we could do to distance ourselves from the sun burning and going on. We were scared to think it would always be like that, the way she kept calling to him, reminding him to shut out the light in the garage, put away the whiskey, wash his hands, come to bed. Whatever man he never was and was, we knew him at 14, the way we knew ourselves as ass men or thigh men, knew him only as wheel man, the best wheel maker in the county whose heart was always in his hands, whose hands were always a little bloody and practice at the art of reinvention. And so we busied ourselves, cross-hatching kindling on bridges we imagined between us and them, the moment keeping us almost successfully from ourselves, the bridge burners we thought we were, only to find it wasn't that there were too many bridges to burn, but too few. That night, we ended up in the dim light of old wheelman's garage, in the oyster of his world where we had spent so many Saturdays before running errands for the table saw, choking on sawdust and where the world was always a minute away from what he wanted it to be, from what we could only guess he wanted it to be. Every time he set about the business of reinventing the wheel, stripping the bark from tissue to sapwood, knifing his way to the heartwood, cutting eight equal rim segments at proper mating angles, drilling the spoke dowel holes, cutting the spokes and hub, removing the burrs, squaring edges, rubbing what needed rubbing. And no one could say just when we stopped believing he would make a wheel that could fly or cure cancer, a wheel that could rise from the ashes, practiced as it was at the art of reinvention, the dream of getting it right. Maybe that's why when we ran to the ends of the earth and wound up in places like Slotesburg or Mechanicsville, Mrs. Grandview never looked back, but instead went about the business of burying the autumn bulbs, grape hyacinths, English bluebells, snowdrops, never asking how she got there or by what roundabout way she would return. Yes, and yes, how she must have loved her wheel maker. The next poem is a more of a city poem, I think, if that's if the, if, it, if if it could be such a thing. Um, I, I guess the sensation that it, that inspired the poem, which very literally was apartment life, could carry over to the suburbs, to the rural, to rural America, to a bad marriage, whatever, to a good marriage. It's called To the Occupant of Apartment 6X. For eight months now, we've been sleeping three, maybe three and a half feet from one another, our heads nearly touching, exchanging, if only by coincidence, a casual cough, the faint hiss of shower water and its imagined echo of skin and shadow, leftover simmer of stainless steel, tomato basil, a crush of garlic, 
whatever body distance assumes as it pads about like a good neighbor. Once I pressed my ear to a glass against the wall to hear the microwave hum of what could be. Once at the end of a sleepless dream where the mind is white noise flowing between the fall and rise of industrial horizon, I considered asking your name to the plaster and laugh separating us like privacy. Lately, in a dream, I've resorted to baking you fruitcake after fruitcake with cups of borrowed sugar, courting you with bouquets of Kierkegaard and Cassatt. In another, we are married, and I'm calling your mother by her first name as ache after ache rears and falls away until finally there is nothing left to talk about. In a dream, I am listening to the dead silence of a door lock brushing against catch plate, footsteps fading into the electric slide of an elevator, floors ringing one by one down the dark shaft. In a dream, I am no longer dreaming. For now, I'll wait for the creak of your bed springs in the night swell. No radio, nothing, just the city outside and the moonlight rolling onto the white belly of my sheets easing into the contour of my body, my hand, sliding along the smooth of its thigh, disappearing in its penumbra. Yes, I say, and without requiring reply, good night, dear. The last poem is what you get after 35 years of teaching English in a small town to high school students, great students. It's been a great ride. I'm not ready to give it up yet. But this is, uh, this is one of those more, I guess, more personal. They're all personal, more private. They're all uh, more, I don't know. This is another poem. Uh, and I think it, 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 it's, um, it's an introduction to, to who I am, I think. It begins with a uh, uh, an epigraph by Kierkegaard. They dare to live only in great herds and cling together en masse in order to be at least something. The poem is titled Postscript. Postscript. He was a storyteller of minor note among an increasingly diminishing circle of acquaintances, mostly anonymous, including a considerably younger soccer coach who taught history through films starring Matthew Broderick, and among a bevy of current and former students who man the registers at local mini-marts. Prone to speak and think of himself in the third person, he was a he, and there were times he wondered how he got here, this small town in which he worked and pulled his trash cans to the curb on Sunday evenings, or if on those evenings he was weary from wandering the wisps of hair he carried on his head, on Monday mornings. Still, he believed immortality was not altogether impossible if one could just find the time. And though this thought offered comfort by degrees, it was a source of constant concern among the locals who had worked out the idea that immortality was a gift, a miracle really, acquired only by labors of love or through natural selection or some other gesture that would otherwise be empty. In any event, he would require a life other than whatever it was they believed he was living. Once, a neighbor whom he knew only as the woman who lived next door brought him a pan of lasagna, thinking he thought his wife, or worse, his mother had recently died, and he was sad to know the woman, or anyone for that matter imagined him that way. For the next three or four nights, he ate the lasagna with a bottle of wine, a dinner roll, and a couple of cigarettes, every once in a while, rising with a flourish, and then sitting down again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. What occurs to me, uh, I love the power of your work and the descriptions, uh, and the narrative, just the feel of it. and puts me in mind of thinking every year for 35 years, you have walked into a classroom full of fresh faces, a few of whom 
think themselves poets and and have been trying trying their hand and speaking original thought and I'll, probably most of them not so much and i'm wondering how you see that world and how that applies to what you do and what you write <sighs> how does my teaching inform my poetry or in in in, in somehow in, relate sure. to my poetry or, or does it it doesn't have to well it certainly is another you know they're 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 two mistresses and they don't they don't necessarily stay in the same room uh it's very hard to you know juggle those those two occupations and so i i, I rarely do i see i i write for 10 weeks in the summer and i revise through the month of september uh, I send out to publications in October or November, and I spend most of my most of the ten months of the year teaching. But having those fresh faces, as you call them, those those live minds, and I am fortunate to be able to work with some of the you know the the more enthusiastic students in our in our area. Um, it, it 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 reminds me of how important it is to put literature first. Uh, when I teach poetry, it's always through the study of poetry. It's always through the re reading of poetry, the, the, the sharing of poetry. Even when I teach performance poetry, which I'm doing right now in my public speaking course, um, perform a unit on performance or slam poetry, it's all, uh, the, the requirement is always there for them to not only memorize the poem, but to analyze the poem, to, to, to have a conversation with the poem, to share those poems with us. So it, having students, in, in a way, it's a luxury because it's one more incentive to allow poetry to occupy its rightful position in, 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 in our society, I think. And, and, and that position is in front of young, fresh faces and live minds. And, and so I, I just love the idea that I love the experience of being able to share something like poetry, exactly like poetry, any day I want with an audience of people that I get to train or condition and, 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 and uh, with an audience of people who are often surprised by it because they have no idea when they come to me what it is, even though they've heard about it all their lives. So it has, it's, it, the, at, at the very least, it's been a source of energy. I and think. There's, there's quite a bit of power in your enthusiasm bringing, bringing that to them coming to them with a real sense of wanting to show them what it really is and how much it can impact the world. Because I know what it's like to be a student with a, with a, with a, with a, with a poet as a mentor. Hmm. You know, as, as, as it was mentioned in my biography um, that, that I worked with Jerry Stern when I was very, I was only 18, 19 years old and mm -hmm. I was invited into a workshop of Lehigh Valley Poets, which he was heading when he was at Lafayette. Um, and uh, this was before we went to Iowa Writers Workshop, and he had, he had just started. He had just published Lucky Life. He had, he had just started, and he was already older. Um, but I know that that experience will be with me for the rest of my life. And 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 when I, I mean, part of my challenge as a poet is to, is the is to deal with the burden of his influence because I always hear him in my head. <laughs> that, that long line, that long line lyrical narrative is, is, a, is a Lehigh Valley line, I call it. And I think it comes from Jerry Stern. And he picked it up from Whitney. He's an, he's an amazing guy. I took a workshop with him uh, and have been interacted with him off and on over the years. And uh, I absolutely respect your respect for him. And that's part of what I hope to bring to my own classroom. That's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for your words and thank you for your approach to teaching them. Thank you. Well, wonderful. So enjoyable. Thank you all for your readings this evening. Thank you for sharing your gifts of poetry. This concludes the gift of poets, a sampler. Thank you to Word Place, the Bundy Museum, and to the Broome County Arts Council. Uh, look for our monthly poetry readings coming soon. Barrett and I will be working on doing this on a monthly basis, probably toward the yeah. end of May. So I Indeed. hope you'll all decide to join in with us. Yes, I suspect I will be asking each of you to drop by and spend 
a somewhat longer time sharing with us and maybe we can talk a little more in depth about these these things thank you very much thank you thank you have a wonderful evening thanks so much take care thanks